Thank you for choosing Hippie Pink Ferret. Please ready your tape while you listen to an advertisement for our latest release. You're listening to Dada or Nothing, a variety show about the visual and performing arts presented by Hippie Pink Ferret. I'm your host, Jojo, and this week we're going on a field trip. Please insert tape. Please insert tape. Please insert tape. Reviewing. Label identified. Dada or Nothing, Season 1, Episode 6. Field trip to the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum. Launching record. Hi, everybody. Today I'm joined in the studio by these two wonderful human beings, one of which you know, Jerusha. Welcome back after your devastating defeat in the Eric Carl episode. How are you feeling? I'm excited to get back in the ring, but I definitely need to train a little more. We had a lovely day, and I'm so glad that we got to go to see these exhibits together. Oh, me too. I took down so many notes that were so delicious. I know. I was like, look at you go. That was so sensual, the way you said that. You can't say delicious like that i'm getting (laughs) this is alex tripodi hi alex i am a person who is related to jerusha over here we are cousins and one of my basic character traits is adhd Uh, so (laughs) that's just part of my character profile yeah yeah, so just expect a lot of tangential things coming out of my mouth another thing i could say about me is that i'm a capricorn sun aries moon and i'm a leo rising i like to play like I don't buy totally into astrology, but that's kind of a lie. Anyone who has spent more than 30 seconds with you, it's bad. We are talking about the Ultrich Museum in Richfield, Connecticut. We took a trip down to go see the Hugo McLeod exhibition that is currently being run at time of recording. Three voices detected. Now analyzing speech patterns. Before we get into that, you guys know the drill. What's your fun fact for today? I have two tattoos that I did not know what they were going to be until they were already on my body. You let the tattoo artist just do their thing? I gave them a general gist and surprise me. Are one of them your favorite tattoo of all time? Neither of them are. Which one of your tattoos is your favorite? I have the words scrambled eggs tattooed above my left knee and it just makes me so happy. They're positioned for you to read them when you sit down, right? No, it isn't. It's in my handwriting, but it is not facing me. It's meant for other people (laughs) to notice. Pardon my mistake. (laughs) It is meant to confuse and disillusion you. If that's not the most fiercely surreal BS you've ever heard. Alex, I would like to hear your fun fact, please. I still have my appendix and I still have my tonsils. Yo, same here. Yeah, I'm basically a time bomb. Oh, so you guys are collectors of tonsils and appendixes. I don't feel like I deserve the term collector of appendixes or <laughs> or for that matter collector of tonsils because someone out there is a lot more qualified you know probably like the motor museum has a secret room that's just full of tonsils have you been to oh god i'm gonna forget the name of this museum but it's in philadelphia and it's all dead bodies and like human deformities you mean the motor museum <laughs> the one i was just talking about thank you honestly i've been wondering that since my eighth grade field trip i'm so glad glad that we just came together and made this full thought. Wow, Sorry. this really is a live just, recording of my last two brain cells having a conversation. <laughs> I just <laughs> stuck out my tongue so far. So anyway. I was uh, worried it wasn't going to end up back inside my mouth. Task complete. The host of the program has been identified as <laughs> System unsuccessful in identifying guest speakers. Temporary profiles for scrambled eggs queen and collector of tonsils have been created. <laughs> Part 1, The Grounds. To talk about what we gathered here today to discuss, the Aldrich Museum is located in Ridgefield, Connecticut. A lovely small town right on the border of New York. It's actually where our parents grew up. The Aldrich Museum was founded by an art collector who also happened to be a fashion designer, Mr. Larry Aldrich, back in 1964. Mm Mm-hmm. As it describes itself, it's one of the oldest contemporary art museums in the United States. <gasps> the museum is one of the few independent, non-collecting institutions in the country, and the only museum in Connecticut solely dedicated to the presentation of contemporary art. You can see living artists doing their thing. Jerusha, you've been to the Ultrich a couple more times than I have. I've only ever been once or twice. I was given the opportunity to be part of their docent program when I was in 10th grade. I got to go and learn how 
how to talk about art and give my fellow students a tour of the museum. And it was a really cool experience. It's actually the birth of me really being interested in an artistic career at a very young age. Fact check. The Aldrich Student Docent Program was founded in 1993 by Harry Philbrick, a collaboration between the museum and participating schools. By its 10th anniversary in 2003, the program trained 5th to 12th grade participants from over 45 schools in 16 surrounding towns how to use adept visual thinking and observation-based techniques to guide classes through the museum and engage in discussions about exhibits. It was recognized nationally as a standard for similar docent programs across the country. The system could not find any mention of it on the museum's official website stating that it currently exists, with links that lead to the program's page no longer supported. It appears that it has changed its names or evolved into a range of different teen programs, which you can peruse at thealdrich.org slash learn. My first time ever going there was when I was 10 years old for a school trip. The first thing I ever saw in this museum was a mound of stuffed gazelles with leather human faces that were studded and glass eyes that pierced my soul. And so 10 year old me just has nightmare fuel. I loved it. 10 out of 10, cash money. It sounds like a one. Wonderful piece. You know, Aldrich is one letter away from Eldritch. The fact that you started it off with some just creepy creature, I kind of love that for you. They say Larry Aldrich haunts the walls of the museum. I love a ghost story. Fact check. It's actually two letters away. The system apologizes on your behalf, Alex. It's such a cool museum, although around it is very homophobic roads. I, I don't think they realized it is not designed for gay driving. It was just one ways all over the place, the most homophobic thing I can imagine. Parking lots you cannot get out of. One entrance, one exit, but there are so many pockets you do not know where you are going. You're pulling up this way, and another car's coming out, and then another <laughs> car's going this way, and all of them judge you immediately. <laughs> it was admittedly a little embarrassing. We we all went to dinner later and one of the things I said is by the time we got there it would have been easier for me if I had walked. <laughs> Literally you did like, walk at one point. I walked back to my car because I was like absolutely <laughs> not no one is driving me. It's going to take 20 minutes to get back. To it me. was like a mystery parking lot because the parking lot led into a whole other establishment which was a car repair place. So you pulled into their weird lot of like <laughs> skeleton cars cars and it got weirdly existential at some point like the i was greaser just, is just dead eyeing you it was kind of psychosexual when i saw that one ultima without <laughs> when i saw the one ultima without the headlights and i was just like this is memento mori right here in the midst of all of this homophobic street chaos <laughs> lies the Eldritch Museum. The New York Times says it is a big guns urban institution in leafy suburban Connecticut. Basically saying that the entire building is a little bit of a rebel. It really is. Even the architecture of the space, it's very angular, it's open, there's so much natural light. As a side note to being in the museum, going there with the two of you especially to be able to experience the space and talk about it actively with other people. Emotions of yours that you didn't know you had come up, but on top top of that, you guys gave me such a fresh perspective. I'm smart, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's just wonderful. No, I completely understand where you're coming from. Can you describe the museum a little bit to me, Alex? As a first timer to the museum, what was your experience like? Well. I would say that my first experience at the Aldrich was very much a positive one. It was a perfect day to be checking some stuff out because it was slightly raining. It was one of those classic New England days. Anyway, the layout was pretty intuitive, I'd say. Even when we were all kind of sticking together, I felt people are going to be able to find me if I wander off and check out some stuff. That's something that I like in a museum. One of the things about the museum itself, especially looking at it from the outside, I was so trying to avoid using the word small. I really like the fact that there was only two or so exhibitions. It was so easy to just pause, take your own time. We didn't even have to coordinate anything like, hey, I'm going into the other room because we were only a room away. It was small, but the nice thing is that it was concise, especially with Hugo uh, McLeod. They used the space really generously to show a full retrospective of this dude's development. Part two, marginal costs. Thank you. 
We were originally upstairs looking at uh, Lucy Herrero's Marginal Costs, a beautiful exhibit that plays a lot on her hometown, New York. It, no, just it was, a little town. Have you ever heard of it? It's called New York? Yeah, it's this really niche, esoteric place in the mountains. It is the first institutional solo exhibition of the artist, and it spans about two rooms and a hallway. The text that is provided, says the artist, is a first-generation Dominican-American New Yorker who surveys power, opportunity, and individual expression specific to the communities she orbits. The art confronts 21st century capitalism through an intersectional lens, combining process with politics as he mixes lived experience with a conceptual art practice that reclaims the language of pop art minimalism and traditional European still life to diversify it. I say the exhibition was a success. I feel like it was very evident what the intent was, not to say this is the lens you should view something, but it speaks very much on its own. I absolutely agree. It left a a very stark impression, especially just the scale of how it was designed. I was thinking some heady BS like, oh, the psychogeography of this room is telling or something like that. When you walk in, in the room are these stickers that are flat against the wall, basically backdrops of typical New York scenery. So they don't take up any real space in the room. They were of pictures that were taken during quarantine, right? It was a mural that was commissioned specifically for the museum. And it is of photos that she took during the pandemic and then had printed on vinyl stickers. They are life-size up on the wall. And you see basic things from a rack of gowns to a food truck to a little box of bananas. The imagery almost comes off as very disjointed on first impression because the collage style is mixed with these very solid colors that are painted onto the background and they seem to be randomly placed. I'm not going to lie, like that gives me some pretty good ideas of what I would want to do if I just printed my own. Like I would definitely want one life-sized clown sticker that I put on the inside of someone's room in the middle of the night and just like see what happens. You're a smegging menace. The only shape that's interfering with the space around you are these impressions of your average fence that's outside of your average New York apartment. They're, I think, intentionally awkward positions in the room. It just makes them stand out so much. Also adding into it the two mattresses that were against the wall. One is actually positioned in front of the mural itself. She imprints a DoorDash bicycle. She imprints a Uber Eats bicycle as images onto these mattresses via clear plastic covers, right? Yeah. And I was trying to tell if it was on purpose, but the textures of everything felt wrong. It was such a permeating force throughout that particular exhibit. Like there would be a newspaper wrapped in a plastic bag shoved through a giant gate, but the newspaper looked like a pillow in its case. I don't know, something about it weirded me out. And at first I was like, oh, it has to do with scale, right? She just picked these materials because it helps depict something of a similarity in scale. And then I look around and I'm like, well, the colors of the giant stickers, there's something unreal about them. This sign that she has would normally be made out of some kind of metal, but it was soft and fabric-y and it draped. And I was like, this feels wrong somehow. I really like the fact that you're playing around with the idea that it felt wrong because maybe having not seen some of these very mundane things for a while, it allowed the artist and us by extension to view these things in the abstract and view them from like a subconscious perspective. Then you notice the negative space. The only thing that's really behind those gates is one singular plastic bag that's indicative of the room next door. One specific bag called Quick Grabs. It's your quintessential black bodega bag when you're trying to stretch your money out and you need your COVID essentials. It was actually like oversized. Like it was large and it was looming on it the is, wall. It is like the size of a mattress. It reminded me of in the beginning of COVID I lived right across the street from a bodega in Philadelphia. We weren't working obviously. We were trying to stretch our money. We were going across the street and we were leaving with the essentials like the butter and eggs. You see that a lot with the second part of the exhibit, her Mercado series, which is these huge grocery bags. And there's so many of them. The entire room is dedicated to hanging these bags. Every single one has depictions of fruit, different kind of groceries. Each bag has a different collection, creating kind of this personality behind yeah, the bag that, that you don't see. That is exactly what she was going for. Like, what's your go-to? What are your essentials? It's super cool to see her build the lives of people in the wake of the pandemic and one uh, her good beans bag had a still life painting pillow in it. I was like wow 
That was such a sneaky little piece to throw in there. Like a picture of a painting printed on the pillow inside of this fabricated bag. I just love the meta ass levels of that, okay? <laughs> like this person did not miss a detail, which was really cool. Including that sort of reference to classical art was such a sly move, right? I feel like someone who goes to your average art museum might, I don't know, judge a piece of work that is more contemporary based on the fact that it isn't some like elaborately painted, like tirelessly rendered, you know, arts changed and more informed by the modern world, basically. Mm. You know what bag killed me out of all of them? I think it was one of the biggest or else it's just coming off as really big in my memory. It was the one filled with newspapers that were just coupons. You know, those newspapers. Yeah, yeah the they're coupon. just all these different coupons. And that was it. There was nothing else in the bag. It wasn't complimentary. It was the main thing that was in this bag. I was talking to the attendants. Uh, the attendant's name was Jack. He was very lovely. Shouts out to Jack. Shout he was Jack. telling me in the artist's own words, she feels her gates are most indicative of gentrification, especially thinking about quarantine and where people were able to store themselves during that period of time. You know, a lot of people could quarantine because they had homes and a lot of people got to quarantine in places with gates and a lot of people did not. And it was Ooh. using this negative space to give that impression, using the air to comment on the vacuousness. All these stickers are clumped randomly and awkwardly together. The mattresses are piled up against the wall, but barely a thing is behind these gates. That's gorgeous. He was really smart. <laughs> <laughs> Gates, man. My favorite part of the entire exhibit was the way that the hallway was used as a transition between these two rooms that we just described. There was this vigil, one of those vigils that you would see on a street corner honoring somebody who had passed away in the neighborhood. She uses the language she establishes in the previous room with the vinyl stickers, and that just gave me spooks because that's exactly what people do when they make vigils in real life. They're just repurposing things from their environment to create an entirely different context. Sometimes when you see those vigils, They've been there for a while. On occasion, you pass by the ones that are maintained, that are being kept up on. It was funny to see one of the stickers was so pixelated that it kind of was reminiscent of how over time things just break down. There were flowers. There was a little statue, like Mary's husband. I'm sorry. Uh, I, Joseph. Guys, I you, didn't, I didn't go purposely. hard in that Sunday school sauce, so I really am Bible illiterate. Okay. Dude, I was in the Bible school. in yeah. the Catholic church. The quickest way to make an atheist is send them to Catholic school. I met so oh. many people from art school who had been in the Catholic school sauce and it had just like made them hate the subject of God. And I'm like, I'm not even that hard line against it. Like I'm agnostic because I'm like, why even think about it right now? So shout out to the upstairs exhibition. Because we went through this the way that we did, we took the back stairs down to see Hugo's work and we ended up seeing the reversed order of what was intended because his exhibition actually starts right in the foyer of the museum. At the foyer. The foyer. <laughs> Hippie Pink Ferret apologizes for the interruption. It is time for the service's hourly scheduled test of the emergency advertisement broadcasting system. Your program, Dada or Nothing, will resume following its conclusion. This concludes the test. Resuming program. Part 3, From Where I Stand. So the reason why we were there, as we said before, we wanted to go see Hugo McLeod. The exhibition is called From Where I Stand. It showcased a lot of his earlier work back to 2014 and then all the way up to things that he's been doing in the past few years, especially during the pandemic. His career as a self-taught artist has been for only about 15 years. He was running a solo exhibition. He is still a living artist. He lives in Tulum, Mexico, and there are several rooms dedicated to him currently at the museum. This is not us advocating for you to go to Tulum, Mexico in search of this man. He probably went there to not be bothered. Somewhere there's like some private detective being like <gasps> And uh, one of the conversations Alex and Jojo and I were having earlier today was of how the title piece brings you back to a very childlike discovery. It was that divine curiosity that you were talking about. I think I, I called it intuitive creativity. Looking at McLeod's work reminded me of the kind of conversations a lot of people had around Willem de Kooning and the woman one. Industrial 
industrial paints and industrial materials. There was no mention of a figure. The way that his art had a certain trajectory from what you could consider this abstract industrial vibe, kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall or trying out different colors. And then right at the end of the exhibit, it's all figures. It's all specific scenes. It's extra fun because chronologically speaking, we started from the end and ended at the beginning. I, and I think that is one of the most important things about our experience. We went downstairs and there's a bunch of paintings. And Jerusha, the very first thing you said was, there are no pigments in this painting. Yes, there is no paint at all on any of these compositions. Zero. Um, they were made from heat sealed single use plastic that they laid on the panels to create scenes. It's a testament to using abstract materials to create realistic situations. It's a really cool, for lack of a better term, juxtaposition. He uses a hot iron to create textures based off how the plastic folds. You see that specifically in his piece, The Stairmaster, with a couple of the bags. When you get closer, seeing the genuine texture of the plastic. Because from far away, the illusion is complete. It wholeheartedly feels like it's just a painting. Alex, how did you absorb these? What did you think when you first saw them? You know, like the first time that you ever ate an Impossible Burger, you sort of get halfway through it and you're like, this has to be definitely real beef. You get like Impossible Burger denial. That's what I was getting with this dude's medium. I was walking in on this man deftly using found plastic to create colors and the definition of the fabrics that the people were wearing. And he was employing the graphics that were on the plastic that he was using smartly as well. One of the first things I noticed was that this recycling sign on one of the bags was at the perfect place in this one mm. piece. And it wasn't big either. Like it was so small, but it was still very obvious based on its placement. I loved seeing the process in the work. One of the takeaways that I had about these pieces was in some, he would be using a fragment of like a rice bag to make the form of a whole rice bag, like a reference to this item with the remnants of it, which I thought was really interesting. He has a very intimate relationship with the material because he clearly spends a lot of time figuring out how he wants to place it. The color was the most outstanding thing to me because I'm like, no, these plastic bags have to be pigmented. These colors are way too rich. I've never seen plastic bags in these colors. What is he possibly doing? And then you said they are from international sources. Like, and those little marks that you were talking about, Alex, you saw things from various different languages. Like I saw a little Japanese in there. I saw a little German. And for recycled material, I'm blown away. The nuance. The squiggly lines on either side. Nuance. Mm -hmm. um, as you moved into the hallway, you saw it. he made one each day of a small plastic composition. Gorgeous to watch the progression of him learning how to use this medium. I was checking out the dates. A lot of those were more recent and the big ones that we had saw before were kind of like 2016. So he had already done that big oh, stuff. Oh, wow. So that's, that changes my interpretation completely. But they are such interesting studies. There's this one piece, the orange flower, that was your favorite. I love that. It was the most complete because within the series, there were a lot of under sketches that were still visible. It was truly a study. They were kind of his fixation during the pandemic. So he was using a medium over and over daily that he had found some sort of perfection with. What a simple subject, this orange flower. And he picks a weird weird position for it. All the other ones are very typical still life images that you would expect from a study of plant life. And then he chooses this weird perspective for this orange flower and renders it in such a way that honestly, if he didn't do such a good job, it wouldn't register as a flower to me. It's almost like an oil painting. He sketches the shapes, but he's not doing really intense prep work because a lot of the work is just figuring out how he wants the plastic to land on the piece. Do you sit there and stretch it out with an X-Acto knife? Literally Really, that must like, be such a chore. Does it shrink when you heat it? Do you have to like tack it? Like I have so many questions. I love a patient daddy with <laughs> strong hands. Oh. He's willing to take the time to see the shape come together. When is he gonna use that plastic bag technique on me? Oh Jesus Christ. I'm waiting. You saucy minx. So anyway, the next room that's right <laughs> after the series of sketches. Shape me daddy. So immediately it's different. These are metalworks. He employs the use of tar paper in a really cool way because I'm not going to lie. I was kind of like, oh, this is like a really 
really ugly texture and in a good way if you know what i mean it's just like very satisfyingly unfolds at like a fractal when you get closer one of the signs describing his profile talked about how a lot of that repetitive texture that square and shape quality were directly inspired by roofs that he saw around his neighborhood the first one you see is literally just like this mashed up gold looking one that has these black details coming through it's a floral motif that's embossed onto the tar paper oh my god you see the form suggested and then the longer you look at it the less like a flower it looks like the less together it looks jerusha you learned a little bit about how he's getting that floral print in the first place he was an antique fabric engraver that they would use to press prints into fabrics it's like used a lot in east asian and certain fashion techniques this is what he was doing before what we were just talking about he's using that engraving tool while the tar paper is warm and then he's adding color onto it the image is the texture in fact if a lot of these were flat i don't know if i'd be as interested in them i mean they're certainly cool to look at but the third dimension is essential to these and it's funny that he constantly chooses florals because i was expecting oh if this one has florals this other one might have i don't know giraffes but florals are a continuous motif throughout his work, even from the beginning. The dichotomy between the floral organic motif and the industrial materials like metal, tar, aluminum foil. It's funny to think about how this is like the life cycle of matter, how it came from the earth and then it was processed into this artificial thing. And then it was turned into something that is being used to mimic nature again. It's a gross distortion. It's almost like a doomed romantic prophecy to be making these images images of this natural beauty out of the artificial material that we are having kill those things out. It really is at the heart of this guy's work. It is frankly an obsession throughout the entire series. Perhaps the florals are more a longing for nature because this is how this person is making art using the abilities that they have and the materials they know how to use. So it says a little bit more about what's in his subconscious because these are abstract. It's not like he's going with a direction. I can't speak for the artists themselves, obviously, but in the way that that I relate to this artist because I'm very big on texture myself. It's about what is visually stimulating to me. And that has to say something inherently about you. So if this is a motif that's constantly present within his work, does that denote longing even though his medium and his tools are inorganic? There is historical precedent to the fact that he's using these florals. He freely admits that not only did his mother work at a florist, but his aunt had a house filled with paintings because she was married to a painter that would often do florals, either still lifes or whatnots, but because he is very intuitive, it's kind of unavoidable to talk about the unconscious when we're discussing this art. Everything he's doing is art that he's making in that moment, and it's completed when it's completed, producing something in his present tense self, rather than planning out things ahead of time as he's doing with his more recent work, The Plastic Bags. Perhaps the flowers are very indicative of the way that he views that kind of temporary nature. His artwork is that reflection of his temporary self. It's him in the present moment. It's who he is. I'm totally imposing my own meaning on this. What is art except to impose your meaning on your experience with it? At the end of the day, it's just very cool to feel like we had a lot to bring to the table with our own perspective because I remember being like, oh my god, that one like screams super ego. You were like, this is just repressed trauma. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was this. <laughs> that was so funny when you were like, what do you see? <laughs> this is trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The minute you said it, nothing else came to mind. The way that he goes into textural abstraction never feels pretentious because it felt like he was putting fragments of himself into these paintings. I know it said that he took some time away from the usual humdrum city life and spent time with a resourceful tent community of folks. He was saying how much he admired how they had like a very spirited excitement for the process of craftiness, you know, using their own ingenuity to create safety for themselves and prosperity for themselves. Fact check. This anecdote refers to McLeod's extended visit to the encampments of Soweto, South Africa in the early 2000s, where he observed the ad hoc construction techniques of the residents. 
This trip inspired him to utilize scraps of copper and bronze left over from his design and fabrication business in his art. Those works ended up being the rest of the exhibit. Retroactively, the plastic bag stuff was the weird stuff in this guy's catalog. You see a lot of his development of this industrial language. There is a certain repetitiveness, and you're not sure why until you look closely, and it's as if he had worked on the piece within squares. When I look at Hugo's pieces, they give me such vivid images and emotions and feelings he has a particularly poignant piece <laughs> when she hits you with your word we've had a personal unsettled feud about the word poignant for the better part of what like five years um now. to summarize me and jerusha once had a little spat as we do occasionally somehow jerusha became well versed in the ancient meaning of the word and i became familiar with the modern usage we both thought the other person was constantly misusing this Ladies. word pray tell for a Vembo like myself, what the heck is the difference between these two? The archaic meaning is sharp or pungent in taste or smell, and then the other is evoking a keen sense of sadness or regret. You would taste cheese and not really like it, and you'd be like, this is so poignant. And I'm like, why are you so upset about it? <laughs> why are you crying over it? Later on in life, I have a severe lactose allergy. Your genes were silently dreading the day that they would eventually have to trigger a lactose allergy. <laughs> I accept defeat. Sometimes you just gotta eat some Ben and Jerry's. Sometimes you just gotta dive into a pint. I have tasted some fabulous dairy-free ice cream. Why do you do this to yourself? Wait. Look, when you're at Blue Colony Diner at four in the morning and you just <laughs> want a black and white milkshake, you accept that it is going to hurt and that you are going to love it. Wow, that scene you just served me, very poignant. So anyway, <laughs> back to... <laughs> So we were big fans of Hugo and where he's presenting a lot of his earlier work, he's playing a lot more with aluminum foil and you see more wood being painted. You see different kinds of textures that aren't necessarily related to welding. Sometimes he looks like he's digging into the canvas with his tools. He originally tried to do it with a drilling machine and he found that it was soulless and absent of meaning. So this man dove in there by hand and carved. We love a drill drilling machine. Strong hands, strong character. Mm. It looks like everybody does have to rush down to Tulum to scoop up this eligible bachelor. We can't even confirm whether or not he's single. The cooler experiments he does in aluminum have a ranging amount of success. I feel like I liked some more than others. He'll do expressionistic underpainting, layer on aluminum, and then cut out designs, like lots of squiggly lines is how I would describe it in my pure academic jargon. Uh, you're alluding to In Between Thoughts, and I was wondering how they achieved this texture with oil paint because it obviously wasn't with a brush. And I realized it was those oil paint sticks. His command of color goes past hues. It goes into palettes and understanding how colors work together. They're so codependent. He did not have a care for the texture being seen through the aluminum overlay. You saw where there were globs of paint underneath. Instead of it being such a flat, reflective surface, it distorts what would have been your reflection in the painting. When we were enjoying these paintings, it all kind of snapped together because we now saw them as a chronology. He pulls the reverse of what you would traditionally expect of an artist or what we've seen in the past couple hundred years. Instead of going from trying out figures to going into pure abstractions, when he gets into figures and he has this formulation of a statement, he can make it in this visual language he's developed from all these different experiments. That's why I think the plastic bag stuff is the cool Coolest. Yeah. Location data downloaded. Now archiving in the collective unconscious. I hope that Mans listens to this whole podcast where we're basically just hitting on him the entire time. And he's just like, yo, all of these people suck. <laughs> like, he's I like, hate everything they're saying. They're all garbage. They're so trashy, I might have to turn them into a piece. I can't wait to be the next. Imprint florals on me, daddy. So anyway, thank you Madam. so much. 
That's yeah. Madam President. Don't. Don't. Madam don't. President. Don't. 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 Thank you so much for joining us on our trip to the Ultridge. This was a lot of artistic commentary, and I hope you enjoyed it. I've been more than blessed with my wonderful guests, Jerusha Wright and Alex Tripodi. It was um, the most divine experience. This is my first time being on a podcast, and I hope I didn't screw everything up too badly. I'm going to be like <laughs> awkwardly cut out of the entire thing, like very obviously. Alex, what did you think about that? And then I'm just not there. <laughs> it's, it's just, just like, crickets. Oh. So uh, there are plenty of other exhibitions. There's this wonderful tarot exhibition that we did not get the chance to talk about. And then we also have Carla Knight opening on October 16th Ooh. of 2021. Her work is so cool. It has all this weird, very alien imagery with sigils and her own kind of language she's developing. It screws with you. It's great. The exhibits change every couple months. So it, it is very important that you do consistently go to the Aldrich, which is one of the most amazing things about it. You can always go and there will be something new for you to see. Guys, if you can give me one big goodbye. 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 End of record. We here at Hippie Pink Ferret appreciate your business. Please enjoy this free advertisement for the audio services you just used. Not All or Nothing is a production of Hippie Pink Ferret. And I've been JoJo, your host. Thanks again to my guests. Sources and links, such as one to a transcript, can be found in the show notes. If you like what you heard, keep up to date with our studio on Facebook or Instagram at Hippie Pink Ferret. That is H-I-P-P-I-E Pink Ferret. If you really like what you heard, rate our show or leave us a comment. I do produce everything myself right now, so whatever means you have to support the field of edutainment is very much appreciated. If you really, really like what you what you heard, consider becoming a patron or making a one-time PayPal donation. You'll get a shout out, unlock exclusive stuff, and every bit of your generosity allows me to keep the lights on and continue providing content. Custom music by Alec Rice. Additional songs and sound effects provided by Descript and Vato Elements Mix Kit, VoiceChanger.io, VoiceGenerator.io, and Zapsplat.com. All audio used is free to use or properly licensed. Again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen. Remember to find reasons to have art in your life. People constantly criticize the museum context for pretension. But that's a topic for another time, obviously. <laughs> another podcast, um, perhaps. Another podcast episode. Thanks for the idea. But... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was channeling my inner Trixie right there. Let's calm it down. I'm sorry. I'm just over here like robo tripping Katya style. Just <laughs> she's staring at the clock. It is 11.22 in the evening and I'm just like, God, I love numbers. Uh, shout out. Not that, oh, it's getting late. Oh, God, God the number I 11. Love numbers. Oh, <laughs>